Hello, everyone, and welcome to At Home with Symphoria. Today, we are with Principal Base and Librarian Spencer Phillips. Spencer, how are you today? Good. How you doing? Good. Good. So, tell us what are you what are you up to? What's it like at your house these days? Uh, I hate to say this, but I, I think I was built for this, not leaving the house. <laughs> Uh, my wife, my wife, also we 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 know how to do this. Let's just say we got mm -hmm. puzzles going, uh, Netflix, uh, everything. You know, so it's it's. I mean, of course, I, I would hope everyone's healthy, but you know, not leaving the house is something I can do. Mm -hmm. I feel you on that. Although I, I have to admit, I am getting a little bit bored because I I realized the other day that my life is different every single day in the right. normal, in normal times. And so this feels like a lot of the same, which I'm not so used to. Right. So a lot of people might not know that you are our Symphoria librarian. And also a lot of people might not know what that means. So I thought, and this is something I'm throwing on you, I recognize, but it's all right. um, why don't you just tell everybody what the librarian does for us? All right. Well, uh, I was really happy to get the position. Uh, I just I just finished my first year. Uh, January was my the mark of my first year. I came in mid season. Uh, it's it's a lot. It's actually I love it. Um, we stay a lot ahead, so we we stay looking at like what's coming up. We order the music and uh, make sure it arrives in time. Otherwise, there's late fees, which I haven't had so far. So I feel very that was my mission to not have any late fees. And um, or rush fees, but we get the music, and then when we when it arrives, we send it out to the principals uh, strings, and then we have them bow it, and then it comes back to me, and then I say me, but my wife helps. I can't lie, uh, and we we put it in the other string parts, so we all the bowings. That's how the bowings get in the parts. So we we literally take the parts from the principals and put their bowings into the other strings, and uh, and then we get it all out. And we have to get it out in a certain date and time. It's uh, two weeks before the first rehearsal, and um, and then we have to keep track of who has what with sign out sheets. Um, also, there's a little bit of work with the the maestros. What uh, I try to be a little bit uh, on top of what addition, like what score they're using, so we have rehearsal numbers or letters. A lot of little things like that get overlooked, and it can it can if that gets knocked out, it's a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I just want to let everybody know that Spencer's doing a great job as librarian. And um, it's such an essential part of any orchestra. That position is just like, you know, everyone's always making requests and needing things early and wanting things different. And I need a copy and <laughs> things like this. So well, that's, that, the weirdest thing to get used to, because, you know, when you start a rehearsal, you're playing. And so like, you know, there was like one issue or something that somebody needed something or didn't have some, I don't know what it was, but you know, I'm kind of like looking around and then I'm like, Oh, Oh, oh that's me. I, I gotta, you know, I have to like put, you know, you have to like literally stop playing and you're allowed to, which is weird. Cause you think like, you gotta, you know, the maestro's up there moving, you gotta play. And no, I, I was like, Oh, that's me to fix it. You know? So <laughs> oh, right. a little while to get used to. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. So let's hop into um, our questions. What are you practicing right now? Okay, so practicing, my wife always says I'm a nerd, but I, I have to stay ahead. Like I have to stay ahead of what we're working on and what, we're, what we do in the orchestra. So for example, like all last summer I was working on this season. And so like now I'm looking ahead, um, Shasti 11, I'm, you know, I'm getting that part going and Misa Slimness, I'm diving into that. But I also, since this we're kind of stuck inside, I did use these last couple of weeks to look at um, there's some tricky Wagner excerpts. So I like put that up and I always have things like that. Like when I have time, like let's hit this a little harder. And uh, so I do that. But mm -hmm. I, I have to say though, like I I try to like pick certain pieces though and delve in a little harder than others. So like I have the score, I'll look at the form and stuff like that. You know, I like to have that stuff. Uh, try to just get something else besides like knowing my notes. Yeah, yeah, well, it, it helps I think. Like when you're in rehearsal and you know like oh, this is going to happen. And it's not a surprise when you hear something. And I don't mean that to sound intimidating for the listeners, but like, like, like I, I like a lot of painting and museums and stuff. And I know like nothing about the art world. I mean, like nothing, but I'll go and walk around. I enjoy it. But like, you know, one time somebody said to me about like lighting in a, in a photo and I had no idea what the heck they were talking about, but I, you know, but there's different, like literally the lighting of the, of the painting or whatever. So like you kind of look at things different. So music has the same kind of stuff that 
you know, you can always just keep digging and digging and digging. So I, mm -hmm. I, I it kind of keeps it fresh and new and, you know, mm -hmm. I can... yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, if you could be anything besides a musician, what would you be? Okay. Well, I gotta say, I only ever wanted to be a musician. That was it. I think, and I think with my track record in school, my, you know, my dad so I remember the conversation, I think I was around 15 or 16, and, and he was like, it's looking like um, the army or musician. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, musician, it's fine. Uh, but uh, I, but that's really all I ever wanted to be. But besides that, I was, uh, believe it or not, a volunteer fireman for a year, and uh, which was a crazy, crazy experience. And I have the most respect for those people. But I could see myself doing that job. Like, you got to be a little off, and there's something weird about, like, just rushing to a, a fire. And, um, but besides that, I think I would probably go, I, about four years ago, I got really into investing and like retirement stuff. So I could see myself doing like a CFA, like, you know, financial, something in the financial world. Mm -hmm. like, oh, interesting. Well, you just have so many choices. So yeah, many well, choices. Right. Um, okay. We all have to know how many rolls of toilet paper do you have in your house? Well, we did find some recently because there was... There was a, a period of concern, but I did find some at the top, or no, at, at Aldi's actually, and uh, and so we have like over twenty four. I know that, but oh. in full disclosure, and 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 Pam knows this, uh, uh, but I got the call that we can't, you know, we have to shut down and everything and and whatnot, you know, and not be in contact. Literally, when I was at my desk in the office, you know, and I was like, well, this means we're not going to be able to go to the store. And I heard this whole toilet paper craze, so I did. I might have just borrowed like a few rolls from the office, and uh, and, and I took and I disclosed it so I can't you know I don't want to get fired or anything for stealing. I I just have to hold on to them you know mm -hmm. just in case, and then I still have held on to those and I will return those. Is there such a thing as toilet paper embezzlement? I don't know, but I don't want to be the first librarian to go down. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just chalk it up to the perks of being a librarian. Yeah, how about that? Just in mm -hmm. case. Thank you for your honesty. We appreciate yeah. that. I did. I literally did disclose it in the car on the way home. I, I sent That's it. funny. Um, we actually have a question from Alex Phillip, and he's curious to know, particularly um, on the film art, when we play live music with the film. Oh, yeah. Um, and he said a lot of a lot of times um, musicians put notes in to the to the scores and their parts, and sometimes you're required to erase them out. But, you know, what is the benefit to leaving those in for future musicians? My handy eraser. They're all over the place here. Um, uh, the benefit, well, it's we have to follow the rules. So, like, if they, in the, when you rent it, they'll give you a contract and it will say um, performance markings can be left in. So, unless someone, you know, makes it like a modern art masterpiece or something, you can leave it in. But if it's, if it's reasonable, you leave, you, uh, if it's like then I erase it, I mean, but if, then I'll leave it in if it's just regular markings. I think it does help, especially for the, particularly for the movies. It's a good mm -hmm. question because um, a lot of times there's those, although those those books are pretty good, like they're really accurate with timing and whatnot. But sometimes it can go down a little different um, in a live performance versus when you can edit it in the studio. Mm -hmm. So um, I tend to leave things if it's if I can leave it, I leave it. Um, but well, and I know for me, I play flute and piccolo oftentimes in the same piece. Mm -hmm. And if I'm having to make switches, it's super helpful if someone has already marked a switch or highlighted a switch um, yeah. somehow that, or says, you know, keep piccolo in your lap because it's too fast to do it if it's not in your lap. Those I find helpful for me too. Right. So um, that was a great question, Alex. Thanks. All right. So um, I, I would like to know what is your favorite guilty pleasure right now? Okay, if I had to pick one, I mean, a lot of people would, I think they would probably guess for me like sparkling water, and that is one. I, I'm obsessed with carbonated water. I probably drink like over six liters a day. It's crazy, but um, I think my guilty pleasure is dinosaur barbecue. I I spend way too much money there. I always get takeout, and I mean, it doesn't, you, you just need to suggest like, hey, do you feel like cooking tonight? I'm like, no, it's dinosaur barbecue. I mean, I'll go anytime. Anyway, it's a little hard. I stocked up on three racks of ribs uh, from Wegman so I can make my own. I'm, I'm not a good cook and I can't make my own. But uh, my wife, though, did awesome last time. Noemi did awesome with the ribs. We were 
they were great. But mm -hmm. uh, I go to dinosaur way too much. Way Do you much. always get the same thing? Yeah. Well, I mean, the full rack, you know, and then, and now they, I mean, they do gluten free now and stuff. I mean, it's like really, I mean, you know, nowadays it's really good, but I'm just mm -hmm. saying, you add, it adds up, you know, so you gotta. <laughs> well, you know, you gotta live a little, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. so. What are you listening to right now? Uh, okay. Well, I was sad to hear, I mean, when this whole thing started, uh, uh, I, I heard John Prine got sick, you know, with the COVID 19, and then he recently just passed away. Um, but I, I, I usually have him on a lot and I have a lot. I'm a big Bob Dylan fan. I've seen Dylan uh, seven times live. And uh, so I have that going, but classical music wise, I recently started a thing and this is totally nerdy and I'm sorry, but I started doing, trying to do one Bach cantata cause there's, there's a lot, you know, and, uh, and then one Haydn symphony a day. So like I have a little checklist at the office of where I left off and I kind of like play it and, and do it that way, you know? Cause I don't know how people, like this is one thing as a musician that it's weird when I, I talk to like audience members, I listen, I mean, I, I ask them and I think that they must think I'm crazy, but like why they like the, like, cause they'll be like, Oh, I love this piece. And then usually when you talk about that, you're always a musician to musician, you know, but when you're talking to an audience member, they don't like, uh, they may play something, but sometimes they don't. And I'm like, how the heck, like, how do you like, that? like, how do you even, what is it that draws you to it? Cause it's hard for me to understand because if you ask most musicians why they like a piece of music, it's like, oh, I played it here with this conductor or mm -hmm. associate it with some kind of physical experience of playing it. And um, I'm amazed at how many of our audience members like fall in love with certain pieces of music and, you know, are obsessed with them and they, they haven't played them. And, it, and I just find it really fascinating because it's really hard, you know, like Mahler symphonies. I, I love Mahler too because I've played it. You know, I, it's hard for me to know everything about Mahler 7. I haven't played it yet, you know, so I always find that fascinating. But um, so I'm trying to like learn new music without playing it. So that was my Haydn and Bach and mm -hmm. experience. And, it, and it's going kind of well. There's, I made it, I like, I can tell which ones I like and more than oh, others. Oh, good. You know, so. Good. I love that. I think that you're right though. I think that um, oftentimes professional musicians have different kinds of listening habits than non-musicians because we have music like we're in it all the time. So I know for me, I actually don't, don't listen to a lot of music that I'm not playing. Right. I just like quiet. <laughs> I'm not that. I can't. Um, no, quiet around here. Yeah. I have no quiet anymore. I'm with, I'm living with two <laughs> teenage boys. So, you know, that's, that ship has sailed. Um, okay. So um, this is the last, the last big question before we jump into the lightning round. Okay. What piece from next season, 2021, are you most looking forward to? Because we are really getting excited about playing again and getting into next season. What are you excited about, Spencer? I couldn't, okay, I was trying to pick, there's two, and I haven't played them yet, which is rare. Uh, so the Mises Lemnus and then Shasti 11. Like those are the two that I'm, I'm really itching to play. And there's a, I mean, Shasti 11's got a wicked bass part. So I actually, uh, well, the, uh, the former principal bassist here, Ed Castellano, uh, he, it's hard to get these parts, some of these Shostakovich parts, because they're rentals. So it's, you can't just go out and buy them easily. So um, he actually was playing it uh, someplace else. And then, so I said, hey, could I get a copy of that bass part? So I, that's how I got a part to practice for uh, mm -hmm. going out. So it's a ways away, but I want to be ready. It's fast. Yeah, it's fast and it's high for me. Um, for those of you Whoa. who've been watching, right. For those of you who've been watching all these interviews, I think that the last three people have said that they're most excited about Shostakovich 11, which will be next spring. And you can count me among those. Um, and I think that we're all practicing it already because it's challenging. So I hope that that inspires some of you that are watching to go take a listen and get excited about it too. Um, I have a Ernie, Ernie Muskies and John Mosbo are on the live here with us today. And they're wondering, since when did pleasures become guilty? And I just meant, I think sometimes pleasures, you know, like something like sparkling water seems very innocent. But then sometimes the there are certain... Bottle. Hmm? The plastic bottle. Well, there's that, right? But there are certain, certain pleasures that feel a little bit more sort of guilty. Ernie, and those are the ones I'm interested in. Ernie, the... Uh... 
it becomes a guilty pleasure at the fourth takeout order that week. That's when it goes. <laughs> the second, <laughs> third, it's not a guilty pleasure yet, but the fourth, that's a guilty pleasure. There you go. There you go. Okay. So our lightning round questions today are provided by Dana Huji and his daughter, Sarah. Right. They came up with these together just for you, Spencer. Are you All ready? Right. Yes. Okay. Um, this is a hard hitting question. Are you ready? Yes. Kirk or Picard? Ooh. Okay. I have to say Picard, uh, but uh, Kirk is, he's a class. You can see my clock in the, in the background there, my Star Trek clock uh, and my uh, Picard mug right here. Uh, but I, uh, I did the, when, when Shatner came to uh, the hall, uh, to, and there was a screening of Star Trek too. I, I went to there. So I kind of have a new love for uh, Captain Kirk. And I, I think the w cool thing about the Star Trek captains is they're all, they all have their own thing. And I mean, I, I like I, all five. I like all five. I can't, I, I mean, but I, if I have to pick one, it's Picard. Cause that's the first one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ooh, um, by the way. Billiards or poker? Oh, billiards, hands down. My, my, but I, 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 in particular, snooker. I play a lot of snooker with my, my father plays snooker. And if you don't know the difference, it's um, the English version. Any, anywhere that was like an English colony plays snooker. So like in Africa and, and, and part of Canada will play, uh, still have snooker tables. So a typical pool table would be nine. I, I, that should have been a guilty pleasure. I, I played a lot of pool with my dad, but uh, it's like nine by four and a half, I think, or something, or nine by five. But a but a billiard table nine by five. But a billiard table is our soccer table is twelve by six. So twelve feet. It's huge. It's huge. And uh, and the pockets are real narrow. So but yeah, I, I will do that all day long. And there's a I found a great. I recently finally found a great uh, pool hall in uh, Syracuse. Real it's by the hour. It's pretty cheap. So. Oh, fantastic. Well, yeah. now now you'll have to. Um, once we can all get out again, we'll have to have a little tournament. That'd be good. And we know who will win, Spencer. No, no, no. no. Um. Guac or salsa? I, I'm not a guac person, so salsa. Mm -hmm. But I recently have bumped up for like the last 35, six years of my life. I've been in salsa mild, but now I'm, I'm, I'm I've bumped up to like a medium. Or wow. I don't know. My mom is insistent that your body changes every seven years, and I used to like fear spicy food, but now I can, now I can do it. So I feel like really masculine when I go in to Wegmans and get the medium salsa. <laughs> Okay. I love that. And now I know what I'm getting you for your birthday. <laughs> um, bumper cars or roller coasters? Okay. I'll say bumper, but uh, like roller coasters are okay with me once I'm in them. Like once I'm strapped in and like, you're past that point of no return where you can't get off of it, then I completely enjoy it. But it's like I have given up on life at that point. Oh, I, yeah. It was to be over for me. So I really enjoy it once that happens. But until that point happens, it's it's like I'm walking to the guillotine. I get yeah. I'm, I'm shaking, like you know. But mm -hmm. I, I, but I think bumper cars because you can, you know, take out some frustration. Yeah, I'm with you on that. And last one, this was Sarah's favorite: tacos or pizza. Oh, okay. Well, not for TMI, but I went gluten free like two three years ago. So pizza has has kind of come down a little bit, although. Pasquale's little slice of Italy is great and in, uh, in, in uh, Fayetteville. But um, so I would say tacos is uh, again, but I can also bump it up now to mild and sometimes hot for the. See, for you're just living on the edge. So you're living on the edge. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us today. If you have any more questions for Spencer, you can pop them in the comments and he'll swing back around and answer those for you. But thank you so much for joining us at home and we'll see you again next Monday at three 30 Eastern for another edition of at home with Symphoria. Talk to you soon. Thank you.